I found a couple of different things. And one of those key things was Ikigai. And you know, I started to challenge where I was and where I wanted to go and through that lens, which is all about bringing essentially what you love, what you're good at, what you can be paid for and what the world needs. And so I pushed through that. And for me, what I love, and, and I'd left it for a while, what I love is sport. I love sport. I love the power of sport. I love what sport can do. I looked at what I was good at. I was able to say, okay, well, I'm really good at understanding people. And I'm also working out, good at working out how to win. And whenever you're trying to tackle a problem or tackle, find a solution or whatever, you're trying to win. What can I be paid for? Well, at that time I was like, well, I can be paid to be a researcher. I can also be paid to be a strategist. Can I do that in sport? Yes, I can. Uh, and then what does the world need? And I truly believe that sport needs to be better. And so the more that I pulled on this, I, the more I found my icky guy and where I wanted to be and what, I, what my mission and purpose was. And so then I pivoted away from what I was doing. I took everything that I'd learned along the way, put it in my toolkit and said, okay, sport is now where I want to go and that's what I want to do and that's the cha that's my purpose in life and what I want to be able to achieve and yeah I've been doing that for what now seven to eight years ever since. G'day guys, on the show today is Adrian Tobin. Adrian is the founder and chief design officer of KinLab, a consultancy that makes sport better through research, human-centered design, and storytelling. Adrian and his team's work includes projects like creating a fan experience strategy for the Australian Grand Prix, and after falling participant rates, working with Cricket Australia to transform the grassroots cricket experience as well. Adrian is a fascinating guy and a highly curious person who will cause you to think deeply about how you go about your career. This is a long one, but if you stick around to the end, I think you'll find it well worth your time. Let's go. I started volunteering. It's all about who you know in sport. Am I going to be calling the last 10 seconds of the grand final? You can connect with the interviewer. The hand goes up when they've got to make a decision. Having a network is one of the most important things you can do. I didn't necessarily follow my passion. I followed my curiosity. Once you've worked in sport, there's no going back. And then lo and behold, before I left, I got offered two. Hello and welcome to the Sports Grab Podcast, the ultimate guide to make it in the sports industry. I'm Ryan Walker and joining me is the human-centred designer, Ruben Williams. We are two mates who met at Cricket Australia back in the day and each week we learn how people made it in sports. We tease out their career decisions, their work habits, their skills and everything they do that makes them great. All so that you can learn how to get in, get promoted and get thriving in the sports industry. Rubes, you are the human-centred designer. How are you, my friend? G'day, Ryan. I'm very well, thank you. I'm not sure about that. That might actually uh, you know, be an insult to actual human-centred designers if I was to join that uh, at club too. But uh, I do try and take little bits from the way they operate because they are very smart people. So um, uh, happy to be here and happy to be here for the 250th time. I don't know how that happened. That has gone incredibly quickly to think that we no. have had 250 conversations plus <laughs> is extraordinary in itself. <laughs> but um, It's an it, insane stat. I know. It's Do you remember when we true. started and we were like, let's just do it for three months and if we hate it, then we can yeah. stop and if no one's listening, then we'll stop and 250 episodes, <laughs> we're still talking crap, well. but it's been a lot of fun. People have spoken. The people have spoken. That's right. That's right. They've, they've forced us into catching up every week, <laughs> which we love. <laughs> 250. We've had a conversation 250 times, which is yeah. incredible. We've probably spent uh, – I'd love to do the stats on how long we've spent on uh, on a podcast. But, yeah, it's an incredible stat. Did we think we'd get to mm. 250? I'm not too sure. But uh, it's been incredible. Uh, and we do love to celebrate our wins, Rubes. We don't sort of, we don't let them go by and, and not think about, you know, the good times and celebrate the uh, the good milestones. And I guess 250, we always kind of talk about cricket scores on the podcast and we've reached 250. There's not many who have reached 250 on a on a cricket field. Uh, I'm not sure if you know of any. 250, uh, definitely not me. You'd have to be looking at um, uh, uh, the, the elites. I think, um, I'm trying to think, yeah. yeah. If Smudge has gone past two twenty odd, or or Manus yeah. made it, Manus was 
pigging yeah. out on runs one summer, I recall. Warner made a massive 300 against Pakistan yeah. the other year. Um, but but uh, 250, 250 is tough. But uh, I remember us talking about Dizzy Gillespie. Mm. Yeah. 250 is like, yeah, you, you've just torn them yeah. apart. So anyway... Not sure how many got to 250, but we can uh, we can raise the bat again. Um, but it got me thinking around some of our favourite episodes of the last 50 episodes because if we're talking about 250, we'll be here for a little while. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, if you've got any that come to mind, but for me, obviously, Brian Taylor was amazing. Um, we've had both the great cricketer boys as well, which was just huge. And there's a lot to unpack just from those two, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Actually, it's quite phenomenal when you look back at our most recent podcasts, say the last fifty episodes, because we look at our we look at the uh, success of each episode based on the most downloads in the first seven days. And at the moment, the top ten leaderboard of most downloads in the first seven days is currently filled with like eight or nine episodes from the last fifty. So Brian's in there. I think both TGC. Mm. Uh, people in there. Uh, Melissa Lawton and Shane Leonage are both in there. So Melissa Lawton from Sale GP, Shane Leonage, a performance analyst for Arena Zabalenka, um, both of which uh, led to me having coffees with them over in London. So that that was being, that was a really cool thing that this podcast has led to as well. Mm. It's kind of like uh, we use the podcast for our own networking purposes and uh, we are very lucky to have these conversations because we have this one and then we can follow up for a coffee down the track as well. Um, but two others that, that come to mind as well, Danny Bowron from Deakin University, a huge part of the podcast and how we were able to really jump in and do what we love and, and that was you know jumping into the podcast initially. So Danny was a huge part of that. Um, first tears on the podcast in the last 50 episodes as well, Rubes. We would hate to not mention <laughs> that. Um, and then we had Jordan Iannuzzi as well. So we've had some really great international guests, not just here in Australia. I think Jordan's just returned to Australia, mm. by the way. But while, when we were doing that episode, he was at the New York Red Bulls, which was, uh, which was pretty cool as well. Mm, absolutely. And then not to mention, we've had a couple of amazing CEOs, a um, couple of amazing female CEOs in that as well. So Michelle Enright, who was the CEO of the T20 World Cup, joined us uh, late last year, Libby Owens. CEO of Champion Data as well. And then around that mark, we had um, a general manager of the Melbourne Stars, Blair Crouch, jump on for a great chat too. But then um, mm. one of my favorite episodes came when uh, Rana Hussain jumped on the podcast. And this came from a recommendation from one of our members called Ankara. She uh, is a, a girl from India who wants to be a sports presenter in Australia. Didn't know it was possible if you were from an Indian background. But when she saw Rana doing her sports presentation work at the T20 World Cup at the Adelaide Oval. She saw her, got inspired, thought, I really mm. want to do it, and uh, has gone on to be a presenter at um, the Mumbai Indians in the IPL. She like accomplished her like 10-year goal yep. in like a matter of six months after seeing Rana. And uh, to be able to share with Rana that she was her inspiration was a, an incredible moment, which um, I think they've now connected and now they're best friends as well. So that's been another cool thing to come out of it. <laughs> Yeah, we love that. We love good podcast stories. There's been a few absolute crackers along the, along the store along the way. So um, that's just a little insight in the last fifty episodes. Um, we we didn't reel off the numbers there, but I'm sure if you go through your feed wherever you get your podcasts, you'll be able to find some of those in there. Um, but happy two fifty ropes. Uh, happy two fifty, Ryan. That's been great, and uh, we absolutely love uh, we love doing this. We're going <laughs> to keep doing it. So we love it. Um, Speaking of the podcast, we've got a big episode, so let's get cracking uh, on that. Um, if you don't already, follow us on LinkedIn, and if you want to connect with us and hundreds of others working in the sports industry, become a member of the Sports Grad community. And speaking of the community, there's been some ripper stories uh, in the last week, and uh, I'll let Rouge take away with those. Yeah, absolutely, Ryan. As always, lots of lots of wins coming through. Heaps of FIFA Women's World Cup action. Uh, this new channel in the wild is going off. Everyone's bumping into each other at work, which is awesome to see. Oh, <laughs> it's so good. It's the best. 
I love it. I'm pretty active in it as well. <laughs> yeah, you bump into heaps of people. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, a special shout out to Rachel Bromley, who has just become the partnerships coordinator at Netball Queensland, specifically with the Super Netball team, the Queensland Firebirds. Uh, she mentioned to us that you know she's been trying to break in for a while and thinking about how to break in and been finding it very tough. So for her to finally get that opportunity, and I think she said like, now she can finally say, I work in sport, which is such a, a cool thing to be able to feel. So well done to you, Rachel. Uh, as always, we've got plenty of events coming up. We've got a job fair coming up with She Hoops, which is Lauren Jackson's organization that helps people or helps women work in, in basketball. And um, so they're going to be jumping on to uh, explain a bit more about their organization. And then every fortnight, we have our speed networking events where you can meet a whole lot of members uh, very quickly. Uh, on top of that, there's a whole bunch of jobs going out. I believe South East Melbourne Phoenix put up a role recently. Ryan, uh, any yeah. others that come to mind there? There's, uh, there's a few lately, um, you know, and I think like Inspire Tech as well. It's a great organization mm. um, doing great work in mental health in sports. They're, they're a sports technology company, so check them out. Um, there's a bunch, Cricket New South Wales, there's a few. Um, Kojo, there's been a few lately. Grand Prix as well, we've put a few up as well. So there's jobs galore at the moment. Um, there's plenty of opportunity. So all you need to do is jump in and become a member and you can you can find those. Fantastic. Well, if you'd like a quick email from us each Friday where we share little blog posts about how people are getting jobs in sport, little tidbits, upcoming events, then uh, subscribe to our newsletter. Head to sportsgrad.com.au forward slash newsletter to subscribe. There's a link in our show notes to join. Brilliant. As we said at the top of the episode, this is a long one, but a really, really good one. So stick around with us and this is going to be an absolute cracker. So grab a pen and enjoy this chat with Adrian Tobin. Everybody wants to study at one of the top unis in the world for sport. And at Deakin, you can do just that. So don't miss your chance to see what sets them apart at their campus open days this August. Check out the -the state-of-the-art facilities, hear from their world-class academics, meet with current students and experience the campus vibe that they're famous for. Join thousands of the brightest students who have already registered to attend this unmissable event. Search Deakin Open Day and take your first step towards achieving your ultimate career. The Geelong Open Day is on the 20th of August, 9am to 3pm. And of course, Burwood Open Day is the 27th of August at 9am to 3pm. So check it out now and start your career in sport. Adrian, welcome to the Sports Grab podcast. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it, mate. How are you, Ruben? Very well, Adrian. I've been uh, looking forward to picking your brain for, for some time now because I find the work that you do fascinating. I find the, the content that you put out on LinkedIn fascinating as well. And um, to introduce people to uh, what you guys do, I want to um, take you back to a, a message that I sent you on LinkedIn in, in 2020. I'm not sure if you recall this, but I think at the time you put out a post asking if anyone had any questions about uh, human-centered design and um, some of the tools and other different practices that people use around that. And so I thought, what a great opportunity. Adrian's an expert in this space. I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fire away here. So um, I want to remind you of the, the question yeah. that I sent you, <laughs> and uh, I'd love to hear your response again so, for people who are interested <laughs> or getting new to this space. But the question was this. Last year, I ran a human-centered design workshop with my cricket team. And the goal of that was to collectively decide on the batting game plan. The result of it was positive. Everyone knew their role. We chased down four totals in a row. However, the process made some members of the team a bit uh, bored and they lost interest because it was quite lengthy. However, with a new season coming up again, we, want to, we obviously want a new, better game plan. and We want to decide on that. But my question for you, Adrian, is what human-centered design approach would you suggest to create a, a shared goal in a team if you only had 60 minutes and knew a few of the members weren't so open-minded to this sort of approach? <laughs> that's, a really, that's a great question. Uh, okay, I will do my best with that again. I hope I answered okay the last time, but um, I'll give it a shot this time. Uh, basically, if I was to use this approach, um, I would um, sit the guys down. I would talk to them about who you're going to play. Uh, is it, um, you know, what's, what's, what's about, have you played them before? 
Have you seen them play other teams? What's their statistics? How can you gather together as much intelligence about them as possible? Uh, and bring that to the table. Um, and also assess yourselves um, and talk to uh, how you guys are performing. Where's your strengths? Where's your weaknesses? A little bit of a self-analysis. And then it's a case of uh, yeah, how might we, which is generally a, la a launch point for any ideation, how might we beat X team? Simple as that. Um, and so uh, what you'll start to surface and you'll go through a process of how might we beat them, you start out with some initial brainstorming. Everyone does brainstorming. Um, but what I would suggest and what we normally suggest is, is that people uh, basically write down what they think first themselves. Uh, generally, the, the um, extroverts, like probably us, uh, the three of us, they fill the room with their ideas and, and the introverts generally keep things to themselves. By writing it down yourselves uh, to start with, you're then able to, um, you'll be able to get the extroverts in the, and the introverts. You put them all up on a wall, how are we going to win, basically? You basically theme those things up. You'll generally probably find that there'll be somewhere between five to eight themes where the, the boys and girls, guys, whoever's part of the, 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 the conversation, I put a range of different things together and they all end up being the same. Um, and so you'll end up with between five to eight ways of beating the team. Uh, you'll then basically go, right, there's our, there's our methods of winning. Um, how do we execute that? Uh, and then start to do some execution and then, and thinking about how you execute on it. Uh, then uh, if you really wanted to get interesting and, and make it tactile, then uh, create some game scenarios and go based on this scenario, if we did this, what would be the result? And then you should surface with everyone agreeing, yep, that's the five ways we win. And this is how we would execute it. And away you go. Amazing. That was, that was a lot more in depth than uh, what I yeah. got in 2020. So I'm glad we've got this recorded. I'll keep coming back to this season after season now. <laughs> Nice, nice. Well, um, yeah. Hopefully, that's uh, that kind of gives you a sense. Uh, it, it is. A, it can be a little bit more complex than that. But if you want to try and keep people on the, it's just all about keeping it as real as possible. Stay away from the jargon. Stay away from, and just make it as tactile and make sure that people can feel that it's. That's what human. That's what human centered design is about. And 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 it's about ensuring that people can can stay nice and close to the challenge or nice and close to the problem and it's really tactile for people so that you can solve it the more that you get lost in language and mumbo jumbo and jargon and, and then all of a sudden people get confused and they jump off and so the more than you can just use plain language keep it really simple and easy um and and take people on a journey uh through that then you'll keep them engaged and then as soon as you get into Will this actually work Brilliant. and create scenarios? They'll bite on it. So yeah, mm. that's a good one. I reckon. I reckon we didn't do the scenario planning last time, and I reckon that that's where all, like, all the fun is. I reckon. And yeah. um, I was going to say, Rubes, did did the session consist of much of that but, uh, in the Wycliffe change rooms? Well, it it was a lot of um, like everyone had like a big piece of paper, and we had a whole bunch of sticky notes, and we like would go around the room and write down a strength say say right you had a bit of paper i'll write all right strength strong in the front foot <laughs> uh weakness uh not very patient at the crease <laughs> so, and so then everyone would have like this collective you know essentially brainstorm of your strengths and weaknesses and and then we kind of had like an overview of what we what we were working with before we could go forth and say all right well how do we beat these teams now but um our uh, persistence with it was the was the issue because we kind of stuck to the plan <laughs> for I think three or four games and then and then it fell off and we missed finals. More sessions required. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> awesome, thank you for that, Adrian. That was terrific. Yeah, <laughs> um, Adrian, we start every episode. Uh, I'm sure you'd listen to a few episodes yourself, but we start every episode with some quick fire questions so that our audience can get to know you. A little bit better straight off the bat so here's a few questions for you um a quick short answers required so i'll start um what was your first ever job first ever job um in a previous life i was a professional athlete i signed a, a sports contract when i was 16 years of age with kellogg's um and i was part of the cereal wars at the time uncle toby's and kellogg's nutrigrain and i raced as a professional surf iron man for for a good eight years there. So that was that was my first job and, 
and and it definitely uh, it, it opened my uh, my mind in lots of different ways. Amazing. And uh, what did you study at university? Uh, so I studied uh, first of all. I did my bachelor of business. So and then post that, I uh, I moved on and did a, an MBA. Um, so a master of business administration. Then I've done a master's of marketing as well. Um, so uh, yeah, they're all through the University of Newcastle. So that's my uh, that's where the, where I grew up and a wonderful university that do and deliver exceptional programs. Nice. And uh, what's your favourite sporting moment? Uh, I'm a dad. I'm a girl dad. Very proud girl dad, but also a boy dad as well. So I'm fortunate enough to have uh, have both. Uh, my my favourite sporting moments are just the, the look on my kids' faces when they they progress a skill or they do something that was unexpected for them and just seeing that on a tra- on the side of the training ground or on a weekend you know, and now as a dad there's just nothing that beats that I, I love the I love a big sporting event like the next person I've been to, to a bunch um, especially some bucket list ones but now that I'm, I'm my, my kids are at a certain age where they're really starting to build a relationship with sport um, there's nothing more that I like when I see that smile that just and that that gleam in their eyes, uh, that's, that's gold to me. Amazing. I love hearing that. It's the first time we've, we've had that dad answer, so that was heartwarming. Yeah. Uh, next question is, uh, what's your favourite interview question to ask of candidates? Um, so I bounce around with this one. Uh, everything For me, one that I know I shared one with you guys, but I kind of pivot a little bit. Um, one I really like, and I mean, I'll share this one because it's, 250 episodes, right? So got to, got to break the mold yeah. a little bit. Um, one I love asking, which every probably employer or manager is going to hate, is basically when was the last time did you break the rules? When was the last time you, you did something different that went against what your manager said or your employee, whoever it may be? When did you trust your gut, go out, make something happen, and it was successful for you? Tell me a little bit about that. Um, that's very much the person I am. I'm a, a disruptive personality. My job is to, and what I, I thrive on is solving problems and doing it in a really interesting and unique way and looking at things through a different lens. So, uh, yeah, and that, and that's a big part of what KinLab does is we don't follow, you know, the status quo. We, we push boundaries and the people that I'd like to work with are ones that really challenge that status quo and, and help us and help us and our clients think differently about the challenges that they face. Amazing. F- funnily enough, it, my, if, if someone asked me that now, my answer stemmed from a human-centered design workshop where um, I got thrown into this workshop about how do we increase participation for women and girls in sport and came out of it with an idea for the T20 Women's World Cup, which led to me going outside of my role and pitching this campaign idea. I'd never pitched anything at CA before. I didn't know who to go to, so I went straight to the CEO. And, um, and um, <laughs> it got... <laughs> got it. Got that. approval for um, a fair whack of money, and they got handed down and, and delivered. Um, so it's funny how these human-centered design workshops just kind of bring new ideas out of you. And um, I had to work with my manager a bit to make sure that everything was getting done, and he felt okay with me doing this other stuff. But um, uh, yeah, these programs got rolled out around the country because of that. So um, yeah, I would have enjoyed a question like that if there that had go. come up. <laughs> There you go. You would have nailed it. Um, bravery. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, and then a, a great leader will empower you rather than mm-hmm. crush it. Uh, and so, uh, you know, from my perspective, um, you will be celebrated for that. Um, you'll probably get a little rap over the knuckles, but yep. that's okay. Um, the, the, the leader should empower you to, to get the result. Yeah. Uh, next one is, are you associated with Love any that. grassroots clubs at the moment? Uh, the clubs that my um, my my young ones um, bounce around in. My my, my son plays uh, rugby with Casuarina Rugby Club. Uh, I live in Kingscliff, which is about uh, thirty five minutes north of Byron Bay. Uh, it's beautiful, um, but yeah, they play. Uh, he plays rugby um, with Casuarina. My daughter is in Salt Surf Life Saving Club, uh, Avalon, uh, and so is, and, and my son's going to join this year as well. So I'm not deeply deeply engaged just yet um i had a, a life of of being involved um both volunteering and 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 racing in in sport and yeah someone like myself i'm, I'm not so gung-ho and going in and going oh i used to be a professional at this and how can i make things better i'm much more standoffish and 
and we'll try and find a way to get a little bit more involved, especially on the surf lifesaving side as my kids get older so um, that I can volunteer a little bit more. But uh, yeah, volunteering is the lifeblood of sport in Australia. There is no doubt about that. And 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 thank thanks to every parent and, and uncle and, and auntie and, and grandparent out there that keeps this sporting system surviving because of their, the commitment that they make to sport, that's for sure. Absolutely. Um, what's one book or podcast that you'd recommend that's helped you? Uh, there's a couple here. Uh, and there's also um, one that's the, one that's super interesting is called User Palooza. Uh, it's by a mate of mine. It's Nick Baumist. And essentially, it's uh, a, a, a field guide to applying what we do in user research. Uh, and so Nick is a, an expert at, at field research, at going out and undertaking behavioural research, um, social anthropology, et cetera. Um, Nick's a Kiwi. He's a he's an absolute champion fella um, and really knows what he's doing. And proud to say he's a friend of mine and he wrote a wonderful book called User Pull Losers. So um, I, would, uh, I would highly recommend checking that out um, as a book if you want to learn a little bit more about getting out and, and talking to people and understanding what they need and where their problems are. So I'd point you in that direction. And the other one that I'm, uh, I'm reading uh, a lot at the moment or kind of going back and forth from, that's a book that I really enjoy. It's one that'll sit on my, my table or my desk or in the studio that I just keep flipping back and forth. And it's called Emotion by Design, um, which is another um, fantastic book by uh, the former chief marketing officer of Nike. Uh, and so that's, that's one I'd point to as well. So um, yeah, enjoy those. Amazing. We'll have to dig nice. those up, I reckon. Yeah. And uh, last one, if you had 30 minutes to pick anyone's brain, who would it be? Oh, I love this question. Uh, I love the intersection and I'm so passionate about the intersection of sport, creativity and design. Uh, and But I'm addicted to high performance. Uh, that's, I think, the former athlete in me and I just appreciate someone who is top of their game. Uh, but I love the when they can show and, and explore other aspects of themselves. And so that person for me would be sitting down with Serena Williams uh, and having a good chat with her. Um, goat tennis player uh, and exceptionally creative person, uh, fashion, entrepreneur, pushes boundaries in lots of different ways and, and talking to her about obviously her tennis career, but where she started out and and, and how um, she was able to navigate what they navigated. Again, disruptive, her dad and her family, finding a pocket within the tennis community in America um, uh, was a, an amazing achievement for them as a group and as, as a family, and then finding their way all the way through and being the best ever tennis player. And then what they do now on the business side of things and her entrepreneurial spirit, it's wonderful. Incredible. Love it. Well, that was, that was a fantastic set of quick fire questions. Yeah. Like that, that, um, that Kellogg's Ironman Nutrigrain partnership, one of the most iconic in Australian sporting history, probably. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it, was a, it was a really funny time. Uh, yeah. The Uncle Toby's guys on Baywatch in their red swimmers carrying cars uh, all the way through to carrying Madonna around through to the Nutrigrain, you know, us guys racing and climbing mountains and racing on beaches. And yeah, it was a really interesting time in, in sport for, for, for kind of ocean sports athletes at that time. Really cool. You were probably on the screens when we were growing up, Adrian, looking at the Kellogg's ads and all that kind of thing. So I've always thought you yeah, were familiar. I'll... <laughs> I don't. I don't want to give my age away too much. Although I am getting a little snowy on the beard <laughs> these days. But I, I, yeah, potentially. I, I get I mean, that gets mentioned to me a little bit. They've, they've seen me in a past life running around in in swimwear, yeah. uh, neuro, yeah, fluoro coloured swimwear. Well, at least <laughs> feels like an age ago. Yeah, at least you know the rig's in order. It's great. So you, you've done well. <laughs> there you go. Um, Right, so before we dive in, we, we touched on it a little bit in the intro, but for those who've never heard of the term human-centered design before, could, could you explain the concept for us for those who, who might not have been exposed to that before? Of course. Uh, uses, there's lots of different language around it, okay? So you've got human-centered design. It's also termed design thinking, people-centered design, um, yeah, it, language it, it's essentially a problem solving process uh it's a process to basically understand um a problem people that surfaces a problem 
that you can then use creativity to solve. It's just really that it's, it can be really complex because behavior, human behavior is incredibly complex, but the process is really simple. I um, mean, it just puts humans or people or customer at the center of that process. So you, you're continuing to focus on the problem that your consumer is having or your the people you serve is having or your athlete is having, the athletes in your, your cohort are having, surfacing what that problem is and then working out how to solve it for them, then putting it in their hands and getting to test it, trial it, work out if it works, pro, yep, it's called prototyping. And then essentially, once you feel really confident, work out how to scale that solution across a, a market or across a cohort or, or across a population of people. Um, yeah, but realistically, it's a problem solving process um, that essentially helps create change in the world, whether that be in sport, in health, in um, transport, whatever it may be. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, that's probably as basic as I can put it. Nice. No, that was good. Yeah. Is there, um, cause like, like when I first came across it, it was through this outside body running this workshop and, um, uh, but it seems like something that could be used every single day, like internally, particularly when I was a, at CA, we try and adopt it a fair bit uh, at sports grade now. Um, what is the uptake of human centered design like across the different industries and organizations you've worked with and do you think it's becoming more prominent or less or what where's it at yeah so i in my uh previous to kin lab and previous to to um really focusing in on sport a uh, large portion of my career was applying different methodologies to tackle social problems so everything from domestic violence to health issues to a whole range of different things uh and that started for me around 15 years ago so uh prior to that i was using other tools in health promotion and behavioral economics and a whole range of different things and human-centered design when i became aware of it um through ideo um, which is probably the global leader in applying what we do design thinking uh and so i became aware of that i read yeah, you know, Tim Brown's book. I was in one of the first intakes of um, humans introductory to human centered design that IDEO um, were essentially uh, running around the world. And, and I became aware of it. And then essentially, uh, since then, it's, it's become a core part of what I do. I've added systems thinking. So I encourage people to check out systems thinking. So it's a combination of human centered design and systems thinking system, you're thinking about a broader world. So think of it geographic wise, it's like a town or a city which is a system. And so within that system, people move and operate and do things. And so you map a system, but then you understand how people operate in that system. And that's what human centered design can really do is help you understand that and surface opportunities to innovate. And so where it's happened or how it's matured over time is that early, early stages, it was heavily used in government, heavily used in finance and banking, um, where money really sat and where innovation, especially where technology transformation was happening earlier. So definitely in banking where you saw banking apps and banking experiences advance. And so you know, those, those early stage, that's where maturity really kicked off. Uh, and so it's, it's quite mature, mature in many industries. Uh, and so about in 2017, uh, I started working with um, Sport Australia, Australian Sports Commission, and applying system thinking and human-centered design to essentially work with them to design the digital vision and digital strategy for Australian sport. And from what uh, we could see, this was kind of the first stages of human-centered design being applied in the sports industry. Uh, and so IDEO had done a little bit here and there for some professional clubs, but it really wasn't widespread. And so that, that kind of was the early stages and kicked it off. And, and, and over time, it's, it's become the industry, the, the sports industry has become more and more mature um, with it. Uh, and from my perspective, we're now starting to see a real turning point where uh, in particular, um, some of the senior execs at, at Australian Sports Commission are talking about customer journeys a lot more than they ever had. They're talking about people-centered design and, and undertaking um, you know, field or ethnographic research to better understand people. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm to say 
till now, the sports industry has been quite immature and, and the take up hasn't been as strong. We've been obviously pushing and I've been pushing hard with all of the work that we've been doing. But I think we're getting to a tipping point where it's going to become much more widespread. We're seeing even in the upcoming participation strategy um, for the Australian participation strategy that's coming through from um, Australian Sports Commission, one of the pillars is experience. And so we're starting to see a real shift in maturity in the industry to say that, you know, undertaking human-centered design, undertaking and using design thinking is 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 now a pathway to improving experiences of people playing sport or, or undertaking recreation. Mm. And I think like for, for people who w would be thinking about how do we solve problems as a team and worrying about what their direct reports might think, as a previous direct report, it's a lot of fun. Like I enjoyed yeah. work a lot more when we were doing that sort of work. And even like Ryan, I used to come and join you and the uh, community cricket team on a few um, weekly updates. Like some of the human-centered design practices were a core part of the weekly agenda, I recall. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. I, I, I honestly, I'd never been exposed to that before, Rubes, until Adrian and Kid Lab came in. And I, I literally remember you know, picking up the pen and uh, getting the poster notes on the wall. That's probably where we've, we've learned it from, to be honest. But it actually just created like a, a creative side of work. You know, like you're not just at your desk, at your computer doing your job. It's like, no, nah, actually use your mind and your own experiences to come up with what, you know, the future can look like. And it actually made work super, super enjoyable. So, yeah, um, I love it. It was absolutely awesome. Yeah, and Cricket Australia has been one of the early adopters. We've been working with them for a number of years now and done you know, umpteen projects and and they've definitely been uh, pushing the boundaries when it comes to human-centred design. And AFL has been the same. Um, so the two the two big the big sports in the country are, are definitely been applying this for a number of years now. Uh, and so the, it's now starting to spread to a, you know, beyond those bigger sports now into into the government and, and into some of the smaller sports. Uh, and so, but you didn't even get to do the really fun stuff, Ryan. Uh, and the really fun stuff and the workshops are great. Yeah. Uh, and, and they're awesome for teams and connecting. To, but to me, and what I enjoy most is going out and living in people's shoes, being yeah. out there with fans, being out there with people playing cricket or playing AFL, you know, spending time with coaches or referees, just being in people's shoes mm. and observing and interacting with them and communicating with them and surfacing such rich data that you can't get through surveys and, and, and you know, data analytics. You, you, get that, you get that real raw and pure relationship data. And sport is, a, sport is an, an emotive relationship. You look at sport in any, like, you know, you look at participation, why, why would I run 10 kilometers and hurt myself and sweat? And why would I do that? That's just mental. It's because <laughs> it's emotive. Why would I put face paint on and put a scarf on and go to a stadium and yell at a group of fellas or girls or women or whatever it may be playing sport? Like, like that's not a rational thing to do. So it's hyper, hyper emotional. Yeah. Our relationship with sport is really emotional. And so, you know, the power of ethnographic research and social anthropology and, and going out and being with people is, is helping us understand that really emotive relationship where people are doing weird and wonderful things. Um, and, and that's where you need to go to get that. Uh, and it, it doesn't get surfaced in a white room. It doesn't get surfaced yeah. in a survey or your data won't tell you why, you know, that crazy stuff's going on. You've got to go out and experience it. And that to me is, is one of the big, big pieces of why I love doing what I do is I'm insatiably curious and I love nothing more than going out and being in people's shoes and, and understanding why they do what they do. The, the why is what, you know, drives me. And if, if more, if more people in, in sport were driven by that why and questioning and getting out of their offices and getting out of from behind their desks and going out and being with the people that they serve and asking them questions, observing them, then sport would advance in such a phenomenal way. Uh, and so, and it's more than just going out and going to a sports match and just saying, oh, I went to a sports match. You, you've got to go out there with a bit of an intent and saying, well, I'd like to know a little bit more why people do this thing. 
and what and so when you go out there you explore that why you observe them you go and talk to some people uh and ask them why they're they're doing what they do and you'll surface up some amazing insights that will help you then lift off into creativity so the workshops are great but nothing's better than going and being in people's shoes yeah absolutely no i I, I remember that so clearly i remember i I don't remember the project super clear but i remember when you guys coming to us and saying we're actually going to go out and and we're going to go live in the volunteer shoes and come back to you guys of what what is actually happening out there and i was like for oh, they're in for a wild ride <laughs> being, being part of the, <laughs> and the they? Yeah. Lives. Um, yeah yeah but like you know you're right you know what you came back with was just like super raw detail about how these people do their you know it's like a second job obviously but you know what their job is like at a career club and how can we you know actually see what the problems are that isn't just from a form that'll probably be the same answer they've given to every question on a form you know so yeah it's um it, it is super cool and not many people i think would um be as ecstatic to get out in the field like you are so you you're dead right by saying if more people did get out and, and actually understood the challenges of the day-to-day i think the uh the sporting landscape would be a little bit different, I would have thought. Yeah. Um, you mentioned a whole host of weird and wonderful things, and I'm sure a lot of people listening are thinking, like, who is this guy who's just got this, like, wealth of knowledge? <laughs> to, to add a bit of context to, to all that, could you share a bit about, like, um, uh, the series of experiences that you've had from, you know, starting off a professional athlete to, you mentioned, uh, King Lab as well. What, what was kind of the journey for you in your career? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, uh, professional athlete, went and studied a lot at uni. One of my first gigs, paid gig in a business, uh, was designing inclusion programs for people with disability. Uh, so understanding how people with disability and the barriers that they experience in getting out in the world, um, you know, just living their day to day, going to the shops, uh, going and, and, you know, to the gym, undertaking recreational activities, seeing their friends, going to the beach, whatever it may be, and understanding what bar- barriers they experienced in order to do that. Uh, and then working out what programs the organisation I was working for, which is now, which is called Life Without Barriers, how, how could that organisation deliver programs that help people living with a disability get out there? That's where it started for me, um, you know, I didn't want to sell Mars bars. I didn't want to, uh, you know, sell newspapers. I, I, I wanted to, you know, create change in the world. And, and that, that was a big driver for me. And that felt like where my mission, my mission sat. Um, and then I played around a little bit. I ended up at a, a really interesting agency uh, in Newcastle where, where I, I grew up and spent most of my time. And I was fortunate enough to, to design a, um, the uh, Newcastle Jets branding for A League One, so the first season of the A League, wow, uh, the gold, the research and and design, yeah. So yep, the why the Jets, obviously the RAF base and flying in formation and and how that needed to link to at the time a relationship they had with United, uh, Newcastle United Football Club in the UK. So it was the Newcastle United Jets before it was just the Newcastle Jets and the why the the planes fly this way because of the stripes. And the linkages to Newcastle United, that squadron feel, so move as a team, that all of that branding piece. Uh, I was fortunate enough to to lead that design very young, um, because obviously being a, a sports brand in a, in a regional centre, they didn't have a lot of money. So when they come to an ad agency, um, where you know it's it's all about these ones, uh, it got tossed to the young guy because the client didn't have a lot of money to spend. And so I was fortunate enough to catch that. And 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 I really enjoyed that project, but it's, it also proved to me that I wasn't ready to go deep, deep, deep into sport again. Um, I, I, you know, being a pro athlete, you live and breathe sport and the bubble that exists around sport. And I wasn't ready for that yet. And so I, I, I pivoted off back into working in government and focusing on on social impact issues and and, and you know, communicating and writing policies and developing programs, et cetera, in government and tackling a large number of different issues over a good you know, 10, to four, 10 to 14 years in that time. Uh, and that is where I kind of really 
honed my skills, really honed my skills with so many different raw challenges that were really, really complex um, human behavior, especially when you're dealing up in the ends of suicide prevention or domestic violence or, you know, heart attack survivors or that, that really raw and challenging behavioral space is, is kind of where I really was had the opportunity to cut my teeth in problem solving. Um, but I also, you know, at the back end of that, I, I got to a stage where I was also a little traumatized. You spend a lot of time with people who are going through really challenging things. Uh, it can it can definitely have an impact. Uh, and so, you know, you know, when you interview 31, 32, 33, 40 women who are experiencing domestic violence right at that moment, and you're trying to understand what they need to help support them in the stage of life that they're in, you don't you can't just drop that and leave it behind. You carry it with you, um, even just as a researcher. And so that was a, a bit, and I ended up head of innovation at Beyond Blue, and I did some really interesting things. And then I, I always knew, that all, within a couple of years prior to Beyond Blue, I was like, oh well, I'd like to get into consulting. I want to, I want to. I'd been applying human centered design. Design thinking was something that I was very, you know, passionate about. And so I, um, I shifted across and took a role of uh, head of um, social and sport innovation at a firm called Simplicit. Uh, which was a design thinking firm in Melbourne and Sydney um, that was doing wonderful work in particular in banking. And so I was focused on sport and social impact. Uh, and I also learned how to you know, run a consulting business. I learned the mechanics. I hadn't done that before. And it, it helped me understand that. Um, and then uh, I pivoted off and, and took my gardening leave and decided that uh, I wanted to return to sport. Sport was something I was incredibly passionate about. It was my passion and my mission in life. I just kind of put it aside for a little while. And then um, I started up Kin Lab and it's been a whole lot of sport and lifestyle ever since. And so that's kind of been my, my journey. Uh, but throughout that, and as I mentioned earlier on, uh, you pick up tools in your toolkit all the way through. And so I started out with your core basic, you know, your business degree. I then did my MBA and I, I did programmatic work and understood how to you know, research and design programs and build things that, and services and products. And then when you're doing that, you start to work out what are the right methodologies to use. There's stage and gate, there's health promotion, there's, so you end up picking up all these processes that end up becoming very handy when you become a consultant, because essentially if a consultant doesn't have a kit bag of frameworks, then they're not a very good consultant. Um, you basically go, well, here's the pro and I've got this kit bag of frameworks that will are applicable to that challenge or that problem to solve or whatever it may be, and and you apply those. And so through that period of time, I, I was very fortunate to use lots of different things and 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 different processes to to do the work, and and now I get to apply them every day in in what I'm doing with KinLab, which is yeah a, a human centered design or an innovation agency um, that is focused on sport and lifestyle, but predominantly sport. And so we work with global brands um, in America, in Europe, and here in Australia, sports brands to essentially, you know, our mission is to make sport better and that's what we do. And so, yeah, hopefully that kind of gives you a bit of a sense of yeah. where I've come from and what I do now. Absolutely. Now that was an incredible collection of experiences and very cool to hear that you, you know, you've, you clearly identify what your purpose is and found a way to, to come back to that and, and still do that every day. Um, I wanted to kind of dig into your jump to KinLab because we have a lot of people come to us with um, issues around career direction and career decisions. Like, had you been thinking of starting your own agency for a while? Was there anything in particular that caused you to pull that trigger and, and get started? What? How did that eventuate? Yeah, well, it, it happened a little bit earlier. Um, and so I'd, finish, I'd got to a stage with government where I was ready to to find my next P or really revisit where I was in my career uh, and what I wanted to do and where I was headed. Uh, and so I basically took six months off. I surfed and I read. That's it. <laughs> I just, that's all I did. I got up every day. I went for a surf and I read books. I went for another surf. I read some more books. And if there wasn't too much of a nor'east wind blowing, I'd have another surf in the afternoon. Um, and, and I just reflected. Um, I feel like that's kind of like Ruben's dream, but just add in writing. 
instead of saying you know, that, that is that is Rube's. pretty much <laughs> <laughs> you'll Rube, you'll eventually be able to scratch the itch let me tell you if you put yourself in that place uh, well, and funny, and that's what i did funny you mentioned that i'm currently in es next to nice and uh, we're in this yeah. random Airbnb, and uh, the host of the Airbnb has very kindly given me his road bike for the week. So there'll be a fair bit of that yeah. going on for the next Jeez. five days. Go. <laughs> there we go. Go go find some self-reflection spots. Yeah, uh, that's it. And so that's what I did. Uh, and I, I, I found, uh, yeah, I found a, a couple of different things, and one of those key things was Ikigai. And, you know, I started to challenge you know, where I was and where I wanted to go and through that lens, which is all about bringing what you're passionate about together with what your mission is, um, with what your profession is and what your vocation is. So essentially what you love, what you're good at, what you can be paid for and what the world needs. And so I pushed through that. Um, And so I encourage anyone listening that is is at a place where they're trying to work out what's right for them um i strongly encourage you to check out ikigai it's it's an amazing uh way of thinking uh and so i did that and for me what i love and and i'd left it for a while what i love is sport i love sport i love the power of sport i love what sport can do i love sport for the athlete i love sport for um, fans. I love sport for development and how it can change cultures and create healthier people. I love the power of sport. And, and I really kind of re- rekindled my relationship with that. I looked at what I was good at. And what I was good at was essentially research. So understanding people, understanding how they behave, what they need, what barriers they have. I'm really, that that is a, a core skill set I have. And I'm, I'm a a really at that time and i hope i continue to be this way but a strong strategic creative thinker uh and so i was able to say okay well i'm i'm really good at understanding people and i'm also working out good at working out how to win um and whenever you're trying to tackle a problem or tackle find a solution or whatever you're trying to win you, you and so tapping back to my athlete mindset i was like okay I'm, I'm good at trying to unlock what that looks like what can I be paid for? Well, at that time I was like, well, I can be paid to be a researcher. I can also be paid to be a strategist. Can I do that in sport? Yes, I can. Um, what I didn't understand was how, what's a consulting business and how does that run? I have no idea. Um, and so I had to work out how that needed to be applied and what I needed to understand there to be able to run KinLab as a founder. Uh, and then what does the world need? And I truly believe that sport needs to be better. It's not as good as it can be for, um, for people who play it it's, uh, or experience it. It's not as good as what it can be for athletes. Uh, you know, athletes are challenged in lots of different ways um, as athletes. Uh, and it's also from the point of view of um, fandom. Uh, you know, sport continue, can, can continue to be made better for fans. And so I believe the world or the world needed sport to be better because sport results in health out better health outcomes from a point of view of movement and moving your body, but also from social connectivity, social connection, which is helps tackle isolation. Isolation is the new, you know, cancer. It's a, it's a pandemic and people are more isolated, even more so off the off um, COVID pandemic. And so what sport does through both playing and being a fan, it actually helps with social connection, which tackles isolation. And so the more that I pulled on this, the more I found my icky guy and where I wanted to be and what, I, what my mission and purpose was. And so then I pivoted away from what I was doing. I took everything that I'd learned along the way, put it in my toolkit and said, okay, sport is now where i want to go and that's what i want to do and that's the cha- that's my purpose in life and what i want to be able to achieve and yeah i've been doing that for what now seven to eight years ever since brilliant uh, i love how like six months of introspection has led to eight months of mm. fulfillment at work which i don't think many people would take the time to stop and and reassess um but w- was there any um like you mentioned the learning the mechanics of running a consulting business was there any sort of doubt about whether you do this you know whether you find the icky guy working for somebody else or 
or doing it for yourself? Was there any anything that you were like, oh, starting a business is hard, I better do it somewhere else? Or was it just like, must run my own business? Um, no, I, 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 I don't think I, it had to be my own business. The hardest part of doing what I do and what we do is, is selling. If you've ever tried to sell, sell something, it is not easy. And hats off to every person <laughs> that goes into sales and tries to sell things. Um, it, it, it's, it's a really challenging aspect. And especially when you're trying to sell yourself as a person and, and your purpose and what you believe in the process, because I'm, you know, in a sense, KinLab sells a dream. It sells an innovation. It sells a solution that doesn't exist yet. And so people need to look at you and believe that, okay, I'm going to invest this amount of money. I believe in you and your team to be able to get the result. And so it, it sales is, is, is definitely something that I hadn't done in the past, um, working in government and working in social impact. And so I, it wasn't something that um, I necessarily felt really comfortable in to start with. And so that was the thing that kind of spun me between, should I go and work for someone else or should I try and do this myself? And I got to a point where I said, okay, I'm gonna give it a crack. I put some money in a bank account. I gave myself three months and said, I got three months. And my wife gave me three months and said, if you can make it work in three months, you look what the next three months looks like and the next three months looks like and the next three months. And that's kind of how it built from wow. there. And that, that's, yeah. And I did it at a crazy time. I get, anyone that asked me when they say, oh, when did you do it? Were you, it's like, no, I just laid down a massive amount on a, this, new, this, this new house. My new baby was yeah, three months old. Like it was literally madness, but what it, it, what it forced me to do was get up every day and hustle my ass off. There was no, I couldn't fail. And as an entrepreneur that you have to have that mentality, you have to have that resilience, you have to have that drive. If you don't have that, go and work for somebody. And that was a difference maker for me. I could get up every day and know that I had the, hus the, the hustle in me to, 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 to fulfill my purpose in this way. Might I ever turn back and go back and be employed again? I, I don't know. But will it help me fulfill my purpose? Absolutely. Because I can make sport better in working for someone as much as I can here. Um, but over here, I, I, I get a drive and a kick that, that um, it would be very rare working for someone. And some of the organizations I've had the absolute pleasure of working with. Um, and my, yeah, my resume is, is pretty cool these days and I'm pretty proud of it. Um, if I'd gone and worked for someone, I probably wouldn't have the organisations I've been fortunate to work with. The, 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 the Ikigai concept, did you find that through like a book or is that like you can just go and read it up or like what yeah. does that look like yeah. for someone who's, who's looking for what you were looking for? Yeah, just jump it into, drop it into your Google search. It's right there. It's championed by the Japanese government now. Um, so all the information you need on, on Ikigai guys is, is at your fingertips. So just drop it into your, into your Google search engine and, um, um, or your search engine of choice. I shouldn't be brand orientated, uh, <laughs> and, and go and search it out. Um, in that early stage, um, it was because I had done a lot of, um, work and research in, in health promotion and methodologies and new ideas in that health promotion space. And, uh, yeah, there was some some uh, academic research that was coming out of Asia around this premise or this concept of ikigai, and that's what led me in that down in that direction. And then once I'd opened it up, there was there was information that I could really get my hands on. Now, just put ikigai in um, into your search engine, and you'll find it pretty mm. easily. And it's wonderful. It's simple. It's pure, and it's wonderful to just self reflect and and for for young people. Um, that are in, in university now or in their early stages of the career, it's a wonderful stress test um, of what you're doing and where you want to go and taps you back into your heart, which is, yeah, if, if you're not doing what your heart pushes you to do, you're never going to be as successful as what you possibly can be. If it's all driven here, um, everything that's driven here has a shorter shelf life. If it's driven here, it'll you'll lock in and you'll hold firm. And when you put the two of them together, Nothing will stop you. Mm. And, and I, I love your um, your business story as well, the way that got started, because I think one way to be successful is put yourself in a situation where you don't have a choice of failure. 
you have to make this work. <laughs> and it will Absolutely. drive you to do incredible things you never thought possible. <laughs> And, and, and again, that for me, that, and this is why when I, I mentor athletes, um, I'm very, very fortunate to talk to athletes and, and, and talk to them about, you know, their next steps and things like that. And, and it's one of the benefits of, of, that I talk to the athletes about, but it's not just athletes, but they've got this um, level of resilience within them um, that is phenomenal um, because they'll get up and train, they get up and lose in competition on a regular basis, but keep on um, going. And they just have this innate skill and this innate resilience within them that is so transferable to being an entrepreneur. Um, and so it's, it's, it, it's helping athletes see that that entrepreneurial spirit lives in, within them and they can tap into a level of resilience that's, that's phenomenal that many, many people can't. But that doesn't mean that, you know, you have to be an athlete to be a great entrepreneur. Um, yeah, many people who have overcome adversity for long periods of time. And so there's this connection correlation between, you know, highly successful athletes who have overcome lots of adversity throughout their young years. And they've built a level of resilience that's helped them as an athlete. And so for entrepreneurs that have, that have lived and, and tackled lots of different challenges throughout their early lives have also built up this amazing bank of resilience. And so if you've, you've made a habit of overcoming adversity, you're going to get, you're, you're going to be more than likely be really good at being an entrepreneur um, because it's a it's a get up, drag down, get in the mud, punch it out life that that um, you need to have that. And if you're not up for that, then it, the best place is to go and work for a wonderful organisation um, where you know it doesn't matter that uh, things like cash flow and whatnot don't matter to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah we know the pressures of that yeah. as well <laughs> cash just does not matter don't, don't worry about it no it doesn't matter no, go away for the yeah, yeah. No, no no oh runways don't talk to me about runways yeah, that's the dirty word yes yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, we can have another podcast about that yeah. i think I um think so. on, on, think on so. that theme of um uh you guys you guys have done some incredible work with Cricket Australia, Formula One, Nike, but um, all of those start with having a problem to solve. And um, now that you've got this like icky guy framework in your, your toolkit of a consultant, I want you to imagine if uh, someone comes to you in their early 20s, say one of your kids has now grown up and they approach you and say, hey, dad, I'm having a problem with my career. I don't know what I want to do, but I want to love my job. If you were to apply, say, the icky guy and, and anything else that you've got in your framework as well, what would you suggest them as a great way to to get started? Um, okay, um, so my sixteen year old son, he's he's pretty much there. Um, so I'm actually there's a bit of a live example that I'm working through at the moment with him. But um, <laughs> but the, the the trick is is that as I mentioned to you before, it's about what do you love and asking yourself you know questions about what you love and what's really interesting to you. What are you good at? What can you be paid for? And what does the world need? Frame that up for yourself as an individual. Okay. Then take that in. So that's self-reflection and, um, and take, take that and really uncover what that means for you. Talk to the people that you need to, um, your significant other, mentors, friends, whoever it may be, and talk to them about to help you crystallize um, what that is. Once you've got a handle on that, um, then let's have a look at kind of a human-centered design process to it, right? Um, and so from there, kind of have a real center around what that looks like. Then you just kind of go into exploration mode. So explore. So what we call is like this double diamond kind of process or framework where you kind of explore, then you define, then you kind of design, and then you, you, you deliver. And so kind of four key stages where you diverge, converge, come through, then diverge again, and then converge again. And that's where the double diamonds come together. But first of all, explore. So, you know, review this the kind of, if it's sport, review the system. You know, understand what high performance looks like and, and kind of what's happening in that in that area of the system. Participation, community sport, explore that if that's your interest area or where you want to go. If it's more on the fan side and, and sports entertainment, dive into the fan world and understand what sports entertainment looks like in that area of the system. And then also where there's inter interconnections. You know, one key thing is if you play the sport, you're more likely to be a fan of it. That's simple. Like, so there's all, there's not three, there's not, they're not separate. 
because they're all interlinked. And then you've got, if it's in the athlete world, that they're the ones on the playing field, right? And so they're all interlinked, but find the part in the system that, that, that is where you want to be, which is aligned to your Ricky guy. That comes through desktop research. Um, that comes through kind of volunteering. You know, do some volunteering. Go and volunteer for a major event. Go and volunteer for your local community club. Just but little, you know, stints that make sense for what you're trying to achieve and just unpack it and feel it and understand it a little bit more. This is where short-term internships can also be really helpful. Um, and so, and, and do some things there where you get to explore the space that you're interested in. Once you kind of feel like this is, this is kind of feeling like what I want to do, then you kind of really define, you go in and deeply understand. So this is where you do things like just, you know, go into the field with your researcher hat on, understand the sport, understand the business, understand the people that that business serves, uh, and really kind of interview interact, observe, do all of those things that help you deeply understand the space, but also the opportunities, because that's going to pay you downstream. And I'll talk you through that in a moment. Um, but gather together all of that data so that you can kind of go, okay, I want to work in high performance. I'm really interested in swimming. Okay, so I've now reviewed the system. I understand that swimming, I'm a former swimmer, or I have a relationship with swimming or whatever it may be. I've I've gone and volunteered for a local swimming club or I've offered to do an internship for Swimming Australia or, you know, the AIS or whoever it may be. Okay, I'm really comfortable in this space. Okay, out of my university degree, I might have a tech background or a data and analytics background or I might have done some AI or machine learning. Okay, I'm carrying that through with me and I'm then going, okay, well, I'm now going into the field. I'm spending more time at swimming competitions around swimming athletes. I might even, you know, be asking the local swimming club if I can come down and just be on the pool deck with the coach for a week and watch them, you know, train high performance athletes, talk to them, observe, you know, that's talk to multiple different high performance coaches, for example, just using as an example, pull all that data down and then synth it, analyze it, work through it. You'll come out with opportunities. There's opportunities here to say, like I said, with the swimming example, there's opportunities here where AI and machine learning can dial up what happens when it comes to analyzing athlete data and, and building out competition strategies or whatever it may be, or helping athletes, you know, swimmers um, perform better on a, on a week to week, month to month basis. So I don't know you and go, okay, I'm really comfortable. I wanna be a starter analyst in a high performance swimming. That's what I want to do. Right. I now need to wait for the opportunities, the formal opportunities to come, or I need to push a little bit to get those formal opportunities to surface. Build out your resume. So this is when you move into design. And so build out your resume. So create the tools that are going to help you get the job. Build out your resume. You know, build out your portfolio. Um, along the journey that I just mentioned, take photos, grab videos videos of your in interviews, videos of you on pool deck, video, like gather all of that together. Because then what you, you should be able to do is put together a nice little package or piece that reflects your journey to date and why you passionately want to work in this space. If you're presenting that as part of a pitch for a job, you have stepped well above everybody else. And so do that. Like, this is, and, and make it about you, but make it about you as you're going along. So build that out and then create your pitch, right? So then you've got your pitch, you've got your resume, you've got your tools, you've, you, you've got your pitch together to go and basically pitch for the job or get the job. Test that with people who are meaningful for you. So this is the prototype testing piece. You know, pitch to your partner, pitch to your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your mum, but then also go and if you've got a mentor or someone that's in your cohort that's working in sport, even better if it's working in swimming or working in high performance sport, go and talk to them about your pitch and test it with them and see what they think. And then if they add some more things in, iterate and change it and then essentially prepare yourself and go and get that job. So that to me, if you went, okay, icky guy, I want to work in sport. My mission is, is to help athletes. I'm really good at data anal analysis and technology. I can absolutely get paid for that. Boom, right. Review the system, know your spot, unpack it, 
work out what role you want, go do more research, capture data and content as you go, then essentially pivot that, create the tools that are going to help you get the job, test them with people who are important to you, and then go get the job. That was an incredibly well summarized start to end package of, of what to do. And I think for anybody who presented that to an employer, employer would be blown away by that because at the moment, most people come out of university with a degree and maybe the one prescribed internship that everybody else has to do and there might be 500 people in your cohort. So if you do one level thing above that, let alone go 10 levels above that and create this you know, full timeline, for example, you could start your own uh, data analytics in swimming social media account and just post on there every couple of weeks. And then by the end of it, it's just like, hey, yeah. here's a link to my Instagram or TikTok account. Mm. And they flick through that and say, yeah, okay, I'm sold. You're in. <laughs> um, that, and, and if it's about, and this is the trick for, for young people, like once you nail what your, your icky guy is, then that's the job you want. And it's about getting to that and you'll know, you'll feel really calm and you'll do whatever it takes. And there might be only five of those jobs that are available in the country or whatever it may be. And, and so you've got to do what's required to win one of those five jobs because you're probably competing against 200 other people. And it also stops you from going into jobs that you don't really want. Um, that you end up just putting in a resume or a cover letter and you just join the bus stop of other people. And But if, mm. if you're able to position yourself into a place where I am so passionate about this, this is my mission and I'm telling you a story and a journey and what I want to do, every employer, and I know I would, if someone tabled that with me and be like, okay, let's do this um, mm. straight away without even considering, you know, I wouldn't need to consider much more other than cultural fit. Um, but if you're mm. showing me this journey and that you're passionate, then it's about going, okay, well, how can I now create an environment where you're going to succeed? And that's to me is when you've nailed this process, the leader sitting across from the table is going, I absolutely want you. And it's the challenge is on me creating an environment where you'll succeed. Mm. Yeah. 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 I reckon, um, the, one of my mates from my cricket club, his name's Scott Walton. And he now works with Dylan Buckley at Producey and um, has done a whole bunch of social media jobs at, at the AFL and in tennis and on the footy show back in the day, front bar more recently. And uh, I reckon he put together a Twitter resume at one point in time. This is just like jogged my memory right now. Mm. And he was like, just created this thread of his career and was adding in GIFs and he would add links to some of you know his best tweets from the at AFL Twitter account. And it was it was really quite cool. And he, Scott's not someone who, um, by his own admission, did terribly well in, in high school. But since then, he's just put his you know, head to the ground and worked extremely hard and been extra, incredibly creative as well. And now he's literally like a weekly, featuring weekly on, on Dylan Friend's show, which gets massive reach. So, um, yeah, he's one who I think is almost ahead of his time in a way with what you're suggesting. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, and... People have been doing similar things like this for a while now, exactly that, and they're the ones that end up winning. And the more that we have doing these sorts of things, the more, and the way that I see it, is that the more people will be in the roles that they should be in and then the sports system will be better for it. So the more that we can encourage, you know, graduates and young people to really find, you know, find their purpose and find what they want to do next and then go through a process to get themselves in the right roles with the right leaders, the sports system will improve. So this is just one way of doing that, and which is why I love what you guys are doing. You're, you're, you're advancing the sports system by doing what you do day in and day out. And, and, and that's why I've been so supportive from the outset, um, mm. Ruben, mm. uh, and, and we've been talking, you know, offline mm. about, about mm. it over the past couple of years. And, um, I think it's wonderful what you're doing and you're, you're making sport better by doing what you do. And I love that. Thank you. Thank you. There's a, and you're right though. Like it, once you get into a, a job that you don't like, but pays you, it's, it's hard to get out. Mm. I think, uh, Nassim Taleb once said the two most addictive things in life are heroin and a monthly salary. So <laughs> you don't want to get stuck in a job that <laughs> pays you well enough that you just stick in, but grinds you to the ground. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, absolutely. Because what we end up doing is we build a life around that salary or that wage, right? And so I have a certain car and I have a certain mm. house and I, I go to certain restaurants. And I and so what ends up happening is, is that salary is then builds the basis for the life that we then create around ourselves and our persona and who we are. And so trying to shift and change that is incredibly tough. Um, and so mm. absolutely, uh, the, the addictive part is I become addicted to aspects of my life and who I am. And I've then created this persona around myself that is all linked to how much I get paid every fortnight or month. Uh, and yeah. that's incredibly hard to shift when you want to make that shift. And it takes a pretty transformational change to do it. Mm. I've never yep. thought about it like that. That's, uh, <laughs> It's quite interesting, isn't it? <laughs> I think about Ryan's self right now. Like, my life is kind of dependent on what I earn each month, and my behavior is dependent on what I earn each month. Like, it's kind of, a, I've never thought about it like that, Adrian. So, you've, you've yeah, opened it, my eyes it, today multiple times. Ryan, it, uh, it, uh, <laughs> it dictates the golf clubs you play at. 100%. It's, it's why I've <laughs> yeah. got a secondhand golf bag. <laughs> I, I should That's... have some perfect, tightless, shiny clubs, but unfortunately, uh, I'm not quite there yet. But you're exactly right, Rubes. Probably dictates the you know the beers you buy or yeah. what golf you what golf course you play at. Uh, but yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, because you you're building that mm. persona of yourself, and then you, brands are associated with that persona. And then you're, you're yeah. cultivating and curating something. I'm using exactly that mm. as a founder of Crest Surf Clubs and, and you know, essentially building and creating the first, you know, the world's first private member surf club in New York is, you know, high net worth people just want to be around high net worth people, whether that be in the club or in, in the, the lineup in surfing or in that environment, especially in, in the United States. And, uh, yeah, there's, they've, they've created a, a level of persona and a level of perception and what they can buy and what they do and how they live their life. And, yeah, it allows us to create a, an experience that is tailored specifically to them because this is exactly what they've done by being millionaires and billionaires. Mm. I've seen a lot of your content around that online. What, what, when's like um, that due to come to fruition? When's the first surf going to happen? Um, so we're building at the moment. Uh, and so we've done a ton of work to get to this point. It's about six years. Uh, you know, I've got wonderful business partners in New York, uh, the Pateras, uh, who um, you know, have uh, their Long Islanders, their Iron Don, they're the local community guys, and 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 they brought they brought me on on board about or oh, what now two and a half years ago. So it's been a bit of a journey, and it's been a wonderful journey. We did we we're using a purely a human centered approach so the customers at the center so the members at the center of every decision that gets made uh and so we're currently uh under construction uh and first waves first waves should run early next year um prototype so testing and testing stage uh and summer uh summer next year in the us will be when the doors open wow amazing It'd be very cool. Yeah. Are you um? You mind if I ask? Are you an equity partner in this? Yes. Nice. And did you have yeah. to um contribute in, or was it like an advisory stake? Um. So mix of both. So contributed in and an advisory stake. And so um for this one, so we've been working in I've, and I've been working in wave venues for a very long time. Uh, fortunate enough to design the the guest experience at Kelly Slater Surf Ranch in in Lamore. Uh, and so went through wow. the process of deep, deeply understanding the consumer of that particular property, uh, and designing out the experience that people are enjoying right now for a hundred thousand dollars a day, US that is. Uh, wow! And it's booked out. It's booked out eighteen Whoa. months in advance. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy, right? Um, and what? So, yeah, it's booked. Yeah, so. Um, and so that 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 was about well, four years now ago now, and so. Design, researching, analyzing, and, and designing a bunch of wave venue experiences since then uh, put put me in a place where my team, uh, when we looked at this particular opportunity, they and we yeah, we've been fortunate enough to look at lots and lots of them. The big 
bright and shiny. They said, you absolutely have to get involved in this one. This one makes incredible sense. I did what I needed to do to get to, to get across it and understand it. Um, met with the Pateras and had a lot of different conversations and the opportunity was there. Um, it was previously going, it was Long Island Surf Park. It was a private, you know, public kind of model on in Long Island that we then transformed the entire business model, brand, experience, based on the research that we'd done into Crest Surf Clubs, which we then identified that the model was scalable around the world. So, you know, there were multiple markets that could absorb this. So we turned it into a globally scalable model. Um, and so, yeah, I, I invested down and, and obviously added in some advisory stuff on top of that. And, uh, and yeah, it's, I'm getting to build a surf club, which just blows my mind that I'm now <laughs> that, uh, getting able to do that, growing up in surf lifesaving clubs all up and down the coastlines. And, and now I'm building a private member surf club in New York is, uh, is, is quite a, it's quite a, an amazing thing that I blow, blows my mind on a regular basis. Well, it's, it kind of know. points back to the, um, you know, the six months you took off for introspection of this is what I want to do. And when you find the thing you want to do, you get incredible opportunities that come off the back of that, which is like when you might think, oh, you, am I just doing this to kind of get a new job that will help me for the next three or four years? It's like, no, you've got no idea what is going to open up for the rest of your life if you kind of go down this path. And this is a really cool example. Yeah, absolutely. People, people can feel it when you're passionate. They can feel that like it's in your gut and you, you want it like it, it and I'm hoping some of what I and how I am you can see that with me it, it, if you're not into it the person across the table can sense it they know that you're ticking a box or you're not really that into it um and so when when you tap into this and and you really start to kind of scale it uh you get opportunities that you never would have expected and that's definitely what's happened for me and um yeah if you if you'd asked me 10 years ago that it, you know, and told me in by 44, you're going to have worked with the brands I've worked with. You're going to be building a wave, uh, you know, wave venue, a surf club in New York and, and looking for more. And I would have just said, you're crazy. You're crazy. Um, <laughs> but that, that, those months of int introspection just gave me a place where I could find exactly what I wanted and how I was going to go about doing it. And, um, and now, yeah, it's magnetic. And, and, when you when people can feel it and you make them believe, amazing things happen. And so yeah. the more that yeah, mm -hmm. the people that are listening to this and, and watching this realize that you know it's not a necessary just about what your academics say or 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 you know what experience you have. If you can sit across the table from someone and they can feel your passion and feel an, a fire in you that is going to only get brighter when you're in the right environment and in the right circumstance, then yeah, that's when you'll get life-changing experiences. Mm. You mentioned there like essentially storytelling and, you know, allowing them to believe in your, in your passion. That's also sort of, you know, an area that you specialize in at KinLab um, and sticking with that theme um, can understand, you know, for that lost, you know, grad or young adult looking for career direction. Um, once you sort of help them understand what they want to do um, and what career options would, would obviously help them and whatnot, what would you do to sort of help them with that storytelling element? How can they be better uh, in an interview, for example? Like, how can I tell my story the best it possibly can be? Yeah, well... Um... And for me, it, it depends. So as we've all experienced, different interviews are structured different ways depending on who you're interviewing with or, or, or you know, government is very different to a sporting organisation, which is very different to a startup, which is... And so for me, it's about understanding the field of play. So knowing, am I going in there? Am I answering five straight up questions where I have to nail those five questions with what I can deliver? Or is this going to be much more of an informal conversation where I need to kind of make this happen for myself? Um, and so it's understanding the field of play. So treating it like, like a game, right? Gamify it. Okay, the field of play is, looks like this. The rules look like this. Here's the rules that I can't break. Here's the rules that, here's rules that I can. And there's always shades of grey, even in government, you know, recruitment. There's always shades of gray and it's up to you to find them. And so, 
you know, understand that and understand where you can push and pull and do different things that are going to make you stand out. So get that and then work out and design what those things are. Um, and if it's the opportunity to tell a story about, and I, I use that example when I walked you through how I would, I would apply this from a human-centered design perspective, you know, capture content throughout that journey, why it's important to you, why it puts a fire in your belly, why you believe that you can make a difference or you can create change, why you're a great team member, why you're good for this culture and it's a nice cultural fit and your values fit, et cetera. And then show some examples of, of, of how you've done it or what you're doing um, and that allow you then to show your, you know, essentially what you can be paid for, what you're good at. Show some of that and tell stories around that and make them real. Like what I see in a lot of interviews and a lot of conversations is big words, lack of depth. You know, the more that you can, I think, tell a really human-centered story, like a human story that's about you and about others, that helps people attach themselves to that. The more that you just use framework X and process Y and, you know, the person across the table isn't an AI bot. They're a human being. Make them feel something. You make them feel something, they won't forget you. And so that's that's tapping into their emotion. And so, yeah, from a storytelling perspective, and this is what KinLab's really focused on, um, is true insight-led storytelling and content development, not, you know, necessarily more shallowed where appropriate amounts of research or insight hasn't been gathered to get that really powerful nugget that drives an amazing story. Uh, and so for us, I've seen a lot, a lot of content um, over my, my time. And I believe how sport can be made better is that the content that is shared outside of the field of play or the lines can be much more human centered and tell a much more powerful story about fans or participants. Or And so the more that we do that, the more that people that are like, interested or have linkages to that sport, they're going to gravitate around it like a tribe and not see it as popcorn. And so the more that that, that happens, um, we'll tell better stories and more people will be, you know, attached to sport and, and be passionate about it together. Mm. I love that. One of our uh, favourite quotes from um, Hamish McLaughlin when we had him on back in 2021 was, uh, if you can connect with the interviewer, the hand goes up when he's got to look at two resumes who are exactly the same. So you're right, and it's an absolute competitive advantage. Yeah, put some, put something in there. They got like put it there. Yeah, and just leave it here. Put it here, but mm. also put it there. Make them feel something. You do that, they're yep. not going to forget mm. you. You might not get this one, but when you pick up the phone or you send a LinkedIn me message or whatever. They're going to remember you and then that is meaningful. So it doesn't matter if you don't just get the job the first time around. If you make them feel something, that puts that puts equity for you with them and then you can always circle back on that. And so that was a piece of advice that I got very early in my time when, when I was racing is spend yeah. up until 35 building a network and then after 35 work out how to monetize it or, or, or use it to your advantage mm. and – and, and so every time yeah. you get a chance to interact with someone meaningful or someone important or, and that and importance doesn't necessarily mean high up in a senior executive level. It, it, it just means that they're important with what you're focused on. Take the time, invest, make them feel something, build a connection, and then continue to go back to that and foster it. Mm. Well, one more example on that. Uh, Kimberly Furness, current general manager of HR at Netball Australia, used to work at Cricket Australia. One of the cover letters that landed on her desk when she was interviewing people started with the headline, I'm going to tell you why I deserve to wear the baggy green. And then the rest of it flowed on to be this marvellous story about who they were. And yeah. I think they ended up getting the job from that. Um, I wanted to ask you about how you have applied design to your week. Because I remember when we connected... Um, probably a year ago now, you said to me, I like to leave Fridays open to have new and interesting conversations. And they seem very deliberate. So I was wondering how else do you design your week? Um, well, I now have a reasonable understanding of when I can perform my best 
And so, you know, one of the things that I do um, is sculpt my day when I know my brain's at its best and when it's not at its firing at its best. So all of the, the, the more challenging work for me happens in the morning that, that uh, again, I think being a former swimmer and getting up at 4 a.m. every day, it, I'm a morning person and that's when I'm firing and that's when I'm, I find that my brain is working its best. So I, I say the hard stuff happens in the morning for me. Um, and then the emails and the more transactional things happen in the afternoon. So I curate my day in a way that helps me use my best self at whatever that, that time is. Um, I find moments of kind of introspection throughout my day. Um, that might be an, an hour's surf in the morning. It might be 15 minutes sitting in the back side, in the back, um, back garden with the sun on my, um, on my back. Uh, and just reflecting and, and, you know, concentrating on my breathing or just investing in myself. Uh, and so making sure that I'm trying to do that regularly, I get clarity from that. Uh, and so I'll curate that. Uh, you know, I've got three kids and, man, they're great at – you can have all the best laid plans, but like Mike Tyson, they know how to punch him in the face. Um, kids are really good at that. Um, and so – just trying to, to have have a plan that you're also flexible and know that things are going to change because they often and very well mostly do. And so you're flexible enough to be able to, to kind of ride with whatever happens on a day-to-day -day basis. So for me, it's it's finding time that's about me and, and also finding that self-reflection time. It's sculpting my day in a way that I can find the best in myself whenever that is in that during that day. And then being flexible and resilient enough to know that stuff's going to go pear shaped, and that's okay. For how many years have you been consistent with that curation day by day? Oh, again, it kicked off for me when I took that time off for six months. Uh, I worked like a crazy person, crazy person for years. Um, whether that was racing and uni and work. Then it was uni and work, and then it was just work, and I just threw myself because I'm, I'm that's my personality. Um, it's all or nothing, and that's also something that I need to manage personally as well uh, is managing that. And so, you know, I got to a point where I was like, okay, um, I need to work out how, you know, just like my coaches used to, uh, how I can curate the way that I live my my days in a way that's always going to be getting the best out of me because if I'm going to go down this path, you know, people people pay me and pay my company, you know, KinLab, really good money to solve things that they don't nece can't necessarily solve for themselves. So there's a lot, a lot of pressure. Um, and so uh, because I can't, I can't burn through $80,000 and then go, yeah, sorry, they kind of missed it on this one. Um, you know, it's a, there's a lot, of, there's a lot of pressure that comes with it. And, and so, you know, and I, I, I made a decision that that, that was the path that I was going to go down. So I needed to work out how I could best manage it. Do I do that every day? Do I make the right decisions every day? Do I look after myself the way I should every day for that period of time? No. Have I, you know, I've got a, you know, I'm first today and I, we work with Movember, um, closely and, you know, I'm a massive, and obviously I was head of innovation at Beyond Blue. Mental health is is a significant, um, you know, aspect to my life. I've got a psychologist that I work with on a month to month basis that helps keep me mind fit, um, and I treat them just like I would a personal trainer, but for my mind. And so, you know, I I've, I've gone through you know amazing days i've also gone through incredibly tough days and sometimes i don't necessarily manage those things the way that i should and and then that impacts on family and co teammates and, and whatever it may be but you know it's just a, a constant commitment to try and be your best self every day and you're not always going to get it right but you've got people around you that can help kind of set you straight and go yeah you didn't get it right you know whack whack or come get a cuddle i know what you need um, but tomorrow's a new day. How are you going to kind of right the ship again? Uh, and so, mm. yeah, I have got lots of different people that, that do that for me. And I've got to, you know, w you know, for young people and in the position like you guys are in and, and who's, who's listening, yeah, have that young person that you've grown up with, that you're incredibly tight with, that's your, your best friend or someone you trust and who you respect. And, 
and really foster and and respect that you know i've got a i've got a really close friend of mine um he won't mind me saying um trent knox who who i grew up with we we started racing when we we're eight years old on in surf lifesaving events and lining up again against each other and yeah we're, we're mates still and 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 really close mates and you know we we share our wins and our losses and he's someone that's been there you know throughout everything that's happened over my life and someone that i really trust and respect so find that person and and hold on to them and invest in that relationship because it'll pay you dividends throughout and you know trent now he's 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 got the the 440 which is that amazing running group in in bondi um that is spread around the country and and trent does amazing things he transitioned his life from being a real a real a highly successful real estate agent to now basically having a positive effect on everybody's lives through a a running community that 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 is is based out of bondi and you know yeah trent and i connect on all of those things and support each other and help each other so you know my advice is is find find that per, your, your outside of your your significant other your partner or find that mate and be that for them and you know work with them throughout your life um because yeah that they'll that'll pay dividends and that's something that i use on a regular basis wow amazing i love yeah. that it's really encouraging really encouraging to see that like you've been doing this for such a long consistent period of time because like ryan and i have been on our own journey of trying to figure out what are the things day to day, week to week that help us be at our best? And we'll, uh, when we're consistent, we'll check in once a month to see how we're going. And it's, and it's been, um, I can probably, I don't know, what do you reckon, Ryan? Like the first year and a half was like a lot of like, that worked, but this didn't work. But then the last, particularly the last six months this year, has been a yeah. lot more routine. It's like we've had that period of discovery. Now mm. we know that these are the set things. Just, just do another day. Yeah. Yeah, hundred yep. percent. Discovery is the fun part around like what you know what works for you and and what doesn't. You kind of go through this test and learning sort of phase, and yeah, I reckon you're dead right, Rude. It's like the first, yeah, the first like eighteen months was always like a bit of a grind to like work it all out. But I reckon now now we've got to a good point where like we know what we know what works for us both, and it kind of just smoothly smoothly happens which just mm. comes from time and, and testing and learning and, and seeing what works. So, yeah. what, I, what, I'd, what I'd encourage with that though, and again, apply a human-centered design mindset to it is you, you're on a journey and your circumstances, your context, your relationship, all the things are going to change on a regular basis for the rest of your days. And so how do you continue to check in with what working and what not? Because what was working two months ago may not be working today because you know you've been fortunate enough to find a wonderful partner or you've had to move house or you've lost your job or something's happened because yeah our context and our circumstances shift and that's something that we try and regularly help sports understand that the 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 lifetime journey that a person has in their relationship with a sport can shift so significantly over that relate that timeline and it has absolutely nothing to do with the sport it could be you know you just had a new baby and you're literally in the trenches for the next 12 months trying to get sleep when you can try and survive like sport is probably the last thing from your mind and all of a sudden okay we've had we've got people dropping off between 30 and 35 well that's generally when lots of people are having kids and men during that time are, are, are heavily likely to also drop off, not just females. And so you have a job to do at that 35 to 40 year olds again, when they're coming out of their cocoon, they're looking to reconnect. How do you make that happen? And so, you know, sport, the more that sport can understand that, you know, these life cycles shift and change and what are products and services and experiences that you are embedding in throughout that journey that's going to help people maintain a connection over a long period of time that sometimes might be really close and really intense and then other times you might not have anything to do with them but you've got the sow that's been said no uh, you know sowed you got the seed that's been sowed you're more likely to get them when they come back you just got to work out how you onboard them again Mm. It's funny you mentioned that example because I reckon 
just a you know probably less than a month ago we had Sam Perry from the Grade Cricketer come on the show and we asked him that question at the top of the episode are you involved with grassroots sport at the moment he said no but I have every intention to be in the future it's just my stage of life at the moment is I've got two kids under five years old my wife is a doctor working 70 hours a week I've just you know if I come to her and say, hey, I'm going to hang out at the cricket club for six hours on a Saturday <laughs> afternoon, like that's not going to go down well right at this point in time. Um, but um, it's like I love just hearing how well you describe that person and just hearing, hey, I know one of them just from, from a month ago. They've been in our show. So yeah. um, it's cool yeah. to hear. Well, it's not hard to – it's not hard to, I guess – uh, understand how you guys are able to des- design such good solutions when you guys know the person so well. Yeah, and, and one of the big ones right now for us is teen girls. Uh, that's a massive problem to solve. Uh, you have 33% drop off of, yeah. of, of girls in t- at 15 out of sport and then another 33 before they turn 18%. And so, yeah, it's a massive problem, but it's also a massive opportunity for sports um, because those teen girls aren't coming back. Uh, they go off into to different pursuits. They go off to the gym. They go off to, you know, essentially, as, as it says, I used to be sporty, but I'm not anymore. And so, you know, it's, it's these ones where it's not that are necessarily always going to come back. The big drop off ones are the big opportunities where innovation can really start to, to take hold that sport as a sector, as a system in Australia and the UK and the United States is that there is a massive opportunity with teen girls, but you're really going to have to innovate to solve that problem um, or, you know, take advantage of that opportunity. And so, yeah, we're really fortunate and I'm really fortunate. I've now spent a hundred, you know, tried to work it out around, you know, well over a hundred thousand hours with people in the field, understanding their relationship with sport um, in multiple different countries. I have a crazy brain that can pull on lots of different things at any given moment. Um, that's how my brain works. And so, yeah, I, I feel very fortunate to be in a position where I, I, I have a very deep understanding of of even why you play sport or your relationship with it, Ruben, or your buddies, <laughs> or same with you, Ryan. Like, um, why have I just gone back to footy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at the age of 28 after two years there of you. playing. So watch those knees, buddy. All right, um, that's probably your, one of your biggest concerns. It's more the hamstrings, Adrian. They they go. go sort of every sort of eight to ten weeks at this rate. So yeah, that's my main so worry the at the biggest, moment. Guys, your age. One of the best things that they can do. The ones that are able to to keep going, keep moving, they get into yoga. And so because of into flexibility, yeah, wow. and so. Um, if you can put that mm. into your toolkit, you will lengthen your your relationship, your playing time, and your relationship on the playing field, which I'm sure you'll want. So what what we see out in the field and in the market is that the guys that get above that kind of in that 28 to 32 range, if they can get out of their own way and add yoga to their toolkit week to week, their relationship on the playing field lasts a lot longer. All right. Googling yoga design. Williamstown. Where are we at? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, Adrian, we've just, we just got one more topic we want to cover before we tie our bow on this. I know we've taken up a lot of your time, so I really appreciate you I'm hanging around. The conversation. Um, but we, we, uh, we usually talk about how people get hired into their, their first job in sport, but you've just hired a brand new CEO in Arthur Gillen, who was the former general manager of marketing and experience at the Australian Grand Prix Corporation. Can you just explain the, the process you went through into recruiting Arthur? What, what did that look like? Um, and so when I was a couple of years, it well, was probably 18 months ago, uh, it really started to surface that I, I was at a point with KinLab where I really wanted someone to come in and take the CEO role from off me, um, that I just wanted to focus on solving the challenges and the problems. And, and that was where I wanted my relationship or my role within KinLab to, to, to kind of continue on. Uh, and so uh, when I started to talk to people that that was what I wanted to do, I got a really straight question from a mentor. If you had your pick of who you'd want across the Australian sports system, who would you want? Um, and I straight up said Arthur Gillian. Yeah, Arthur is 
I met Arthur in an interview years ago now and one of my first sports projects, um, which was to do some innovation in the A-League. Uh, and I interviewed Arthur as a kind of a, a stakeholder interview um, when he was at Melbourne Victory, he was head of marketing there. And uh, that's the first time I'd met Arthur and we kind of talked over and over and then I watched his career flourish and, and watched his skill and not only his skill, but Arthur's just a fantastic people leader. You know, anyone that you'd say Arthur Gillian to anyone who, who knows Arthur, they can't stop applauding and loving on the guy. Um, and so, you know, it, it became, it was like, okay, if I had my choice, it would be him. Um, did I think that was going to happen? Not necessarily. Did I have a significant intent of going out and headhunting him down? No. Um, it, I just knew he was the archetype of what I wanted. I wanted someone who who was incredibly smart, a strong people person, a great leader, um, you know, a disruptor who challenged the status quo. I knew what the archetype was and he was the closest that I could see in the market um, that that could create change, but also had experience internationally, um, having his background in the UK and, and obviously a relationship with Formula One and, um, and MotoGP and having dealt with international brands, which is important for us. Uh, and so, you know, we started working with with the GP guys and Arthur was on the team um, and essentially, you know, he, yeah, he was doing what he was doing and he, one day we, we kind of started to get to talk about it and I said, yeah, I'm in the market for a CEO and, and Arthur just said, oh, you know, that's interesting. We just left it there and, and then he came back and, and he said, Adrian, can you, let's talk a little bit more about that. And so we did, and and bada bing, bada boom, he's now working for us. He just needed to understand the process a little bit more as well, and who we are, and what our values were, and making sure they aligned with him. And and yeah, it ended up yeah somehow, and it wasn't necessarily or it wasn't without any specific intent. I had an archetype. There's probably three or four archetypes that fit, or people that fit that archetype in the country. Um, and yeah, he was definitely one of them. And I was lucky enough, yeah, that he was interested in joining us. And yeah, Kin Lab's better for it. That's for sure. Brilliant. Amazing. I love how like he was just a, a really good fit. Because at the start, I thought you were going to say, oh, we, we knew the guy. We chased him really hard. But yeah. it just sounds like you guys were true to who you, you want to be as a company. He's true to who he wants to be. And it, was, it just clicked just kind of happened uh and that's what i love it and that's also the way i go about what i do too um i don't necessarily do formal recruitments i don't you know make people submit resumes and do, let's just sit down and have a chat and tell me a little bit more about you and let's follow over the next month or two let's just you know chat keep talking i'll follow what you're doing let's keep touching base and it's it's informal and if it ends up working out and and they're the right people. Um, I'll feel it in my my gut, and and off they go. And we've had some some wonderful people work for us, and who are now on doing amazing things with Accenture and um, and Canva, and um, you know, in back in it and and the NRL, and and so you know, Kinlab and all of Kinlab's success is thanks to them. And they've come through. They've touched us with their magic and they've had their time and they've moved on to amazing things. And, um, you know, they're the reason why KinLab is, is where it is and where it continues to be is because, yeah, w wonderful people have, have come along and graced us and graced me with their skill and their presence and have made KinLab better for it. Love it. Uh, Adrian, it's been one of the great episodes. Um, last question for you, um, and that is, What's the lasting impact that you want to have on the sports industry? Um, again, it just it comes back to making sport better. Uh, I I want to see less athletes with mental health challenges off the back end of their careers and a better transition into the rest of their lives. I want to see more people playing sport and enjoying sport and, and connecting with each other. I want to see lower suicide lower mental health challenges lower obesity i want to see that i want to i, I, I want to see it in this tackling loneliness I, I yeah i want to see it from the perspective of you know 
by making sport better, we're having impacts on health and communities. That's what I'm in this for. And the more that we can have that effect and that more people are playing, more people are connecting, more people are following and athletes are performing better on the playing field, but are also not burning themselves to the ground in doing so, then we've, 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 we've played a role. You know, I, I'm, it's fair to say we've worked with 43 different sports now, sports, not necessarily just sports businesses. It extends out from that. Um, you know, I'm very proud to say I, Kinlabs somehow touched every Australian. Whatever sport they play or whether they officiate, whether they volunteer, whether they play, whatever it may be, something that we've done has touched every Australian. And then that's expended off into Europe and, and to the US as well. And so, you know, I'm very lucky and I feel very fortunate that that's, I've been able to achieve that over, you know, seven, six, seven years now. Um, now for me, it's less about just having that effect. It's now about, right, let's make some, let's, let's change the system. Like the system needs to change. It's not what it should be. We need to change it. We need to make it better. And when we do, there'll be less people suicides, there'll be lower mental health, there'll be lower obesity, there'll be less loneliness and the world will be a better place because people will be healthier. Outstanding. Before we wrap up, Rubes, any other episodes relating to this one that people can tune into? I don't, I don't know if there's anything that relates to I was saying the question and I was like, it, there's not one. <laughs> <laughs> this is the most unique and standalone episode we've ever had. But I think for people who have enjoyed uh, what you've had to say, Adrian, and other curious type, I think, They'll also enjoy listening to Jay Lee, who's a senior vice president of um, of product at the NBA, whose team is responsible for designing things like NBA.com, NBA app, NBA League Pass, all that type of thing. And uh, we did a part one and part two with him. I reckon he's episode 83 and 85, a long way back in 2021. Nice. Um, yeah, another very great operator as well. So another one to enjoy. Awesome. Adrian, it is, uh, it's been special, I think I'll say, episode 250. Um, and I, I think ever since we started the podcast, you've always been someone who I think we've always aspired to get on here because we were both sort of touched by, you know, your experience and we were both at CA um, and just being involved in various projects with KinLab during that stage of our career just enabled us to really, I think, to be honest, I like probably just think big and think outside the square in terms of like what what does sport look like for us and what does a career in sport look like? And actually, when you get to go to work, you can be creative and think about sport, not just in the little bubble like you mentioned before. So it's always been um, something that we've, we've really wanted to do is to get you on the show and um, it has not disappointed at all. It's been absolutely <laughs> awesome um, and not just... You know, some of the things you're saying around not just to work in sport, but just life in general. I think there's lots of lessons people can take from what we've spoken about today. So really appreciate your time. I know you've almost given us two hours of your uh, of, of your day. So um, we really appreciate it. And um, yeah, hopefully we can catch up in person very soon. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for taking the time. And if I could leave with one bit of advice is just keep asking why, 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 why is something the way it is? Why do people behave the way they do? Ask why and then allow that to pivot you off to be more curious and be more creative to solve problems. And so just keep asking why and if people can do that, great. And I'm always open for anyone to reach out to me. So um, if you want to connect, just hit me up on LinkedIn, send me a message and um, I'll say good day, and we can connect that way. So uh, I thoroughly enjoyed the chat, boys. Love what you're doing. Think it's outstanding. And I think we're all on the same page that sport can be better and you're helping build a workforce that um, can definitely do that. So bravo and hats off to you. Guys, it's time now for the People's Segment, Ask Sports Grad, where every week we answer a question directly from our community. If you'd like to ask a question, first become a Sports Grad member at sportsgrad.com.au slash community and then add your question to the channel named Ask Sports Grad. Now, Rubes, this one comes from Sarah and she says, how do I get experience in grassroots sport? I don't know where to start. 
Mm, great question. We uh, we harp on a lot, harp on a lot about grassroots sport and the the benefits of it. Not only are you going to get amazing experience, but you'll meet a lot of amazing people, and you also create common ground with people who work in the sports industry because everyone has come through grassroots or is involved in some way, shape, or form. So, mm. it's a no brainer to get involved. But in terms of where do you start? It's probably something that feels a lot more complicated in your mind than actually is because the beauty of grassroots sport is that it's all volunteer-led and um, you really just have to be willing to put your hand up and say, hey, I can help in some way, shape or form. So if you're not already playing at a grassroots club, then you want to find one in your area that uh, ideally you enjoy. So if you like netball, go to a netball club. If you like cricket, go to a cricket club and um, go down there and say, hey, I am looking to get into the sports industry in the future and I'm looking to build up my resume with some experience. I'd love to help out with your club in events or sponsorship or strength and conditioning. Whatever you can offer, go in with a really targeted approach and say, these are the areas that I'd love to get some experience in. Maybe it's social media. Um, If you can make your pitch even more compelling so that it's a no-brainer for them to say yes, then have a think about the specific impact you want to create. For example, if you want to help a grassroots club grow their social media account, you might say, hey, I've jumped on your Instagram feed and uh, you got about 200 followers at the moment. The last time you posted was uh, 11 months ago. I reckon I could grow your following up to 1,000 by the end of this season and I reckon I could post consistently and grow the culture of the club and grow the engagement of the club by um, taking ownership of this channel and and helping you guys use it properly. And I reckon if uh, you said that to a club president who's already got a full-time job, probably got a family to look after, and then you add in the extra hours that they do at the club, they're going to say, thank God, like, please help us. What else can you do? (laughs) Like, if you can save people's time, you'll open up opportunities for yourself. So... Um, get down to your local grassroots club, come with a specific ask in mind and uh, doors will, will suddenly open for you. But um, we um, we go deep into these topics in uh, the sports grad community. So if anyone wants like a really sort of step-by-step um, approach to doing this properly, if you want to hear the Q&A that we have with our members and uh, the further follow-up questions that they have on this topic, uh, there's a whole bank of these resources in the sports grad community. I think there's a one-hour webinar on this topic. There's probably a couple on this topic. We've, we've done a few yeah. from different angles. Yep. But if you want to go deep, then um, check out the sports grad community and uh, the resources that come with it. Yeah, that was an awesome webinar. And I think in that session as well, we sort of go deep about how to actually approach an organization as well. So literally, you know, we almost like draft up your email, to be honest. <laughs> like we just go <laughs> deep into it. So if you are interested... Uh, absolutely jump in and you can you can get more info. Uh, if you want to ask us any questions like like this one uh, or you want to ask our friends in sport a question, as we said, just become a Sports Grab member. Uh, we mentioned as well each fortnight we jump on an online session, so whether that's speed networking or a job fair or a Q&A, that happens every fortnight. So jump in and get involved. We said this Wednesday we've got uh, She Hoops, uh, which is from Basketball Australia, jumping on. So it's going to be a great session. So become a member between now and then and you can jump on that uh anyway in the meantime find us on linkedin find us and give us some love if you love the show subscribe on apple and follow on spotify thanks for listening we'll see you next time hey guys one last thing before you go if you'd enjoy a quick email from us each friday on all the latest job openings networking events q a's with industry professionals and latest podcast episodes then subscribe to the sports grad newsletter Head to our website www.sportsgrad.com.au forward slash newsletter to subscribe. There's also a link in our show notes to join.